We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. And so before we jump in this morning, um, I have a question for you. So have you ever entered into a situation um, where something has been offered to you um, that seems just too good to be true? All right, something that's a little, uh, little out there. Um, maybe it's just a lot. Maybe it's extravagant, whatever it may be. Um, well, I have a story for you because I've been in that exact same scenario. So it wasn't too long ago um, that my wife, Ashton, and I were at home visiting my family. And uh, I got a call from an 800 number. And normally, I don't answer those because um, they're telemarketers and whatnot, but I decided to answer this one. So I pick it up, and the lady says, hey, this is this Caleb? And I said, yeah. And so we talked for a little bit, and uh, right out the gate, she mentions to me that I have qualified to have a large portion of my student loans forgiven. No? Yeah. So as a recent college grad uh, with a lot of debt, I thought, man, this is great. Like, this will be an awesome thing. And, and Ashton's looking at me. She notices, like, I'm, I'm happy now, and she's, like, kind of looking at me, like, what's going on? And, So we continued to talk, and I'm on the phone with the lady for probably about an hour. Within that period of time, she's asked for my personal information, and of course, like, there's a blessing before me, I'm gonna give it to her, right? It's just simple stuff, like, social security number, um, tax ID, mother's maiden name, all that. You know, just the small stuff, right? It's just one of the small stuff. So I'm giving her this information, and uh, she puts me on hold for a minute because she's going to uh, like write some stuff down in, in paperwork. And, and at this point, I turned to Ashton, and I said, babe, you don't understand what's going on. Listen, so this lady has reached out to me through this company and is going to forgive me a large portion of my student loans. And she's like, but why? And I'm like, gosh, really, that question? Well, the only answer I have for you is, I mean, the government has noticed I'm a good person. Like, I mean, at the end of the day, it's what it is, right? The government has noticed, and so they're reaching out and giving me grace. And she looked at me, of course, and said, you know, like, that's, that's cool, and don't take this the wrong way, but, like, you're a good person, but, like, not that good of a person, right? And so I just sort of blow it off. It is what it is. We move on. Well, it gets to be probably about an hour and a half in our conversation, um, the lady's asking for more information, and I end up giving her more information. And, and it's at this point that Ashton begins Googling the company, right? She wants to know more. And so she puts me on hold again, and then Ashton turns to me and confronts me, and she says, babe, listen, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know about this. When I Google the company, they're a scam. They're going to take your money. Like, they've done this to hundreds of other people before, and so you need to get off the phone. And so I'm frustrated, and I look at her, and I'm thinking, man, like, why, she, why can't she get on with this? Like, this is, this is a blessing from God, right? I'm getting uh, forgiven my student loans. Like, she's so skeptical. You know, what is this? Well, time moves on, and it's about two hours in the conversation, and uh, I know, it's crazy. I start to get, I get a, little, uh, a little nervous. And as I'm sitting, and I'm, I'm asking them questions, and they're giving me vague answers, and I'm not getting a whole lot back, this thought hits me, I mean, out of nowhere, I guess it was you know, given of God, I don't know what it was, but thought just hit me. What if this is a scam? <laughs> what, like, what if, what, if this, what, you know, what if this isn't real? And so I, I turned to Ashton and I said, babe, listen, um, I know that we were like really excited about this. I know that you were on board and, and we were moving forward with this and it was gonna be great, but I don't know, I think I, I think I have to end the call. And so I hung up the phone and I stand before you with just as much student debt. Um, actually, probably more because of interest and you know the gaining and all that good stuff. So anyway, I tell you that, one, because it's funny and I like to make fun of myself and show you that I'm young and naive. But at the same time, I tell you that this morning because that's exactly how I viewed Jesus when I grew up, right? Too good to be true. So in the darkness of my childhood, walking through things like abuse, divorce, um, hard financial situations, family sickness, like those kinds of, as I walked through those things and as family and friends sort of mentioned Jesus to me and, and told me about him, it didn't line up, right? How was someone in my situation, how was someone where I was supposed to experience the life and the grace and the mercy that Jesus gives when all I'm used to is darkness, Right, Jesus was too good to be true. I'll put a uh, quote here in my notes. When I was introduced to Jesus by friends and family, what he represented was just too good to be true. Jesus was said to bring things together. I was used to division. 
Jesus was said to be light, I was used to darkness. Jesus was said to heal, I was used to sickness, and Jesus was said to provide, but I was used to barely making ends meet. And so I wanna walk you through a passage of scripture this morning, specifically one verse of it. Um, but it's a passage that when I finally surrendered to Jesus, I clung to it, and I still cling to it today. So if you guys will turn um, in Mark 9 with me, I'm gonna be going through uh, verses 14 through 27. I'm just gonna be on the screen as well. Before, or, as you're turning there, I'm gonna give you a little background. So the book of Mark is one of the four gospels, right? Accounting Jesus' life. And so chapter nine is sort of a snapshot amidst the, uh, the book of Mark that details some of Jesus' miracles and the things that he did during his three years of earthly ministry. And this passage specifically is talking about Jesus healing a boy with an unclean spirit. So let's jump in, starting in verse 14. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And so what we see here is Jesus walks up, he sees a crowd, and they run to him, amazed. And so Jesus asks, what, what's going on? What's all the commotion about? And they tell him, a uh, father emerges from the crowd and tells him, hey, I have a son who has an unclean spirit, right? It's doing all these crazy things to him. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they couldn't do it. And so Jesus, frustrated, says, bring the boy to me and let me have a look at the situation. Verse 15 tells us that the crowd knew who Jesus was. Right, they, it says that they ran to him amazed. You know, maybe they saw some of his miracles. Maybe they heard by word of mouth who he was. But either way, they knew of Jesus. And I mentioned before that in my story, as I grew up, my family and friends told me about Jesus, specifically my, my mom and my grandparents um, had, had talked to me about Jesus and told me who he was. But like I said before, it was too good to be true, right? The things that I was walking, the things that I was dealing with were just at odds with who Jesus was. And so, like the crowd, I knew of Jesus. I knew that like he was doing things with other people, but I assumed it wasn't for me. Right? I assumed that was for the people who have it put together, not for this guy. You know, the rest of the passage shows us the problem here. Right? It shows us that there's a father, and he has a son who's sick with an unclean spirit. We're gonna find out in a little bit what that spirit was doing to him, but either way, it was a distressful situation, right? And the father, in an attempt to fix it, goes to the disciples and asks them to cast it out, but they can't, right? The things that the father is trying to do to fix his scenario aren't working, and that's exactly where I found myself, right? The darkness and the things that I was walking in, the things that I was experiencing and seeing, I couldn't handle them myself, Right? I would try to do all these different things, go home and, and put my earbuds in and blast my music to try to forget, right? Or, or go and try to talk to other people and see, like, is this a normal thing? Like, is this, does everyone go through this and I'm just unaware of that, right? No matter what I tried, though, I couldn't get past it. Let's keep reading in Mark. Let's jump into verse 21. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And the father said, from childhood, and has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. So we see here that the father gives us a little more detail on his son's scenario. Right? He says that he's been sick with this unclean spirit since childhood. Scripture doesn't give us an exact amount of time, but it's implied that it's been a while. Right, the father's been dealing with this for a while. And so as I was reading this and trying to like interject myself in the story, like better understand what's going on, I realized that I don't resonate with it as well as some of you probably do. For you parents out there, 
Take a moment and picture your son or your daughter having a sickness that overtakes them, right? And nothing you do, nothing you try can fix it, and it lasts a long time. Like, just picture that for a moment. Like, the distress that the father must be in, the pain that he must be dealing with. Right, so in that pain, in that distress, the father approaches Jesus and says, if you can help me, please, please help me. So when I was going into um, ninth grade in high school, uh, my family um, sort of uprooted and moved to a very small town in southwest Virginia. I would say the name, but none of you have ever heard of it. Um, It's out in the middle of absolute nowhere. And so when I shifted from there, I had moved in the past, right? I'd I'd moved quite a bit, actually. But this move was different because I had stayed in this area for several years, and I had started to get some friends. I started to, like I said, plant some roots. So when we moved, I was pretty upset. Um, I started going to a high school where none of the kids were like me. I was different. Uh, I didn't fit in. I had trouble making friends. And honestly, like, I was just kind of tired of my situation. I was sick and tired of the hand that I was dealt, right? the life that I had to live, the darkness, the no friends. Uh, it was just, it, it wore on me. So about halfway through my first semester in ninth grade, a motivational speaker came to town. Um, he came to my, to my school and basically talked about overcoming adversity and what it looks like to deal with a tough past and, and move on in the future. And so a friend of mine told me that he was actually coming back um, after school to deliver a Christian message because he couldn't do it in school. And so I decided, you know, I guess I'll go. I don't have anything else to do. The guy was kind of interesting to me because, I mean, he was very engaging and I said, that's fine, so I'll go. So I ended up attending this service, and the guy walked through sort of his story, um, which was very similar to mine, and he talked about how Jesus played a role in that and how when he surrendered his life to Christ, like, things got better. And so at the end, he asked us to pray a prayer. And the prayer was admitting that we are sinners, that we're in need of salvation, and that, that Jesus is the only Savior, right? And so I thought, you know, I've tried everything else tried to fix it on my own and just doesn't look like I can, so I guess I'll pray this prayer. There's gotta be something magic to it, right? Like, when I say it, things are gonna get better. Right? When I say it, all of a sudden, my parents are gonna get back together, right? When I say it, my home situation's gonna get better, right? But do you know what happened after I said this prayer? <laughs> Nothing, right? Because I selfishly prayed this prayer so that I could be happy. I didn't believe in Jesus. There was no surrender in my heart. I had no desire to surrender to him. I thought, well, I'll say these words, it's sort of like a genie, right? I'm gonna get some magic, I'm gonna get some wishes. But that didn't happen, right? Nothing in my life changed. I didn't surrender to Jesus. So much like the Father in this passage, I reached out to Jesus as a last resort. But I didn't believe in the power of Christ. Let's keep reading. Let's pick it up in verse 23. It says this, And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and and said, I believe, but help my unbelief. Hmm. Pastor Gabe mentioned um, at the beginning of the service that this is our first week of our new series called One Verse. Um, We're gonna be walking you through some verses that have particularly impacted our lives. I really wanna hone in on verse 24 here because this is my one verse. This is the verse that I have clung to for as long as I can remember. So let me tell you why. So as I came out of my ninth grade year and prayed that prayer and nothing changed, I decided to make my peace in unbelief. I wasn't angry or anything. I just thought, well, it's just another thing that didn't work, and so we move on. So the next few years, uh, while I was still in high school, I, I got some friends, and some of them were Christian. And I thought, that's awesome. Like, Jesus is working for you, that's great. You've got it all put together, your family's not struggling, like, that's fine, more power to you, right? He's not for me, he's too good to be true. And so, that's sort of how I lived, and it, and it did me pretty well for a while. Um, I, I got really into music my senior year, just sunk all my time and energy into that, and uh, I just, that's sort of how I lived, and I, I felt pretty good for a while. Till my second year of college, 
I was uh, pursuing a degree at Radford University, not too far from here. And the degree I was pursuing, I was actually going after it because I thought it was going to make me a lot of money. You know, and I thought, well, if I can get money, then maybe like the financial struggles that I went through as a child, maybe those won't happen, and maybe I'll be happy. Right? Again, trying to fix things myself. But I'll tell you, that second year of college, I had no sense of direction. Right? I had no sense of, pat. my passion started to dwindle, no sense of dreams, no sense of like really anything, no sense of hope, right? There was a hole inside of me that I couldn't ignore anymore. Right? I know when I say that this morning, I'm striking some nerves because either you've been there before or you're there right now, right? Nothing you buy Nothing you obtain, no person, no situation, nothing fixes it. Right? Nothing satisfies. And that's exactly where I found myself. And if you're honest with yourself this morning, you may be there right now. Right? Maybe you were invited to the point, it's your first time, or, or maybe you've been coming here for a while, but there's this hole inside of you that you just, you can't ignore it, but you can't fix it. Right? It's there, but nothing you do fixes it. So when I was in that situation, I remember um, sitting in one of my classes in college. I was looking out the window. It was a beautiful fall day. And uh, sort of zoned out. And all of a sudden, in the back of my head, this question appears. And it goes a little like this. What are you doing with your only life? Like, what are you doing with your only life. And I remember right there in that moment, I became so intensely aware of my lack of direction. So intensely aware of the fact that I was selfish. Right? There was never a moment when the things that I did were for anyone but me. Right? My lack of dreams, my lack of passion, that all just came flooding to my mind all at once. I realized in that moment that I was lost. So I remember I stood up from my chair and I left class early um, and I ended up going back to my apartment. Man, I tell you, when I walked in the doors of my apartment, I hit my knees and I prayed for the first time. And I, I, I know I mentioned before that I prayed this prayer, right, and expected it some, to work some magic, but this was different. Right, have you ever been in that moment where you are straight up, face on the ground, arms outstretched, like desperately praying? That was me. Right, and, and the crazy part of it was, I didn't come with an agenda to my prayer. Right? Before, I was like, okay, God, like, I'll pray this prayer, you know, and maybe like, some things will get better. Like, maybe some things will fix. But this time, I came with a heart ready to trust the Lord. Right? I didn't come with, God, why me? Why this? Why the situation? Why can't this be better? Why can't you just make this better? No, I realized in that moment that I was not only selfish, but that I couldn't fix it myself. So I came with a heart ready to trust the Lord, ready to just say, Jesus, I don't know what you have for me. I don't really even understand what this whole idea of following you is, but whatever you tell me next is what I'll do. And so when the Father in Mark 9 comes to Jesus with doubts, right, and he says, if you can help us, please help us, right, how, does, how does Jesus respond? Does he say, hold up, hold up, you don't have full faith in me, so I can't do anything? Right, or, or, or does he say, man, you, you don't have it all figured out? You don't have your life put together? Like, what's, what's happening here? I, come back to me when you got it figured out. No, he doesn't. But instead, he leans in and says, if I can, trust me. If, if, if I can, lean into me. If I can, watch me work. You see, the Father came with doubts, and Jesus didn't come with rebuke, but instead, he came with a simple question. If I can, all things are possible for the one who believes, right? He challenged the Father, and that's exactly what he did with me. He gave me that one simple question, what are you doing with your only life? He pulled me in with a challenge, 
with that question. And he held me close through faith. So when the father realizes this and he, he comes back to Jesus and says, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe those are extremely important words that we can learn a lot from this morning. But I wanna draw your attention to two things. The first of those is this. It's okay to have doubts. Jesus is not scared of your doubts. There's never something that you can bring to the table that Jesus says, whoa, that is too big, I can't handle it. Never. Right? There's never a situation where you walk into a scenario and you ask Jesus something and he says, whoa, because you're doubting, I, I, I think I'm, I'm going to step out. Right? Come back to me when you got it all figured out. Man, I lived my life filled with doubts. Right? When I was growing up, I had so many questions about so many things, but a lot of it had to do with Jesus. Right? Are you real? Can you love me? Can I ever heal from the things that I have done and the things that I have gone through, right? And if I'm honest with you, I still struggle with some of those doubts today. I mean, standing right here, right? Like when, when I maybe, uh, when, I, when I don't have a whole lot of money or a lot of resources, like I immediately doubt Christ's provision. Right? I think, oh, if I don't have the money, then who's gonna show up? How am I gonna get food? Like how am I gonna live, right? I doubt Christ's provision. Well, when I do something wrong, or when I mess up, immediately my mind, man, I, I don't know if Jesus loves me anymore. Is he just gonna kick me to the side? Does Christ still love me? Right? I know I'm not the only one here who struggles with doubts. Right, maybe you're here this morning, and you're doubting Jesus because your marriage is failing. But you're gonna leave here and you're gonna go home and you're gonna argue with your husband or your wife and no matter what you buy, no matter what you do, no matter what you say, it doesn't fix, right? So maybe you're doubting Christ in that way. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe you're doubting here this morning, maybe you're doubting Jesus because your loved one is on their deathbed. Right, maybe it was sudden, or maybe, maybe they're suffering, whatever it may be, like because of that, because of that burden, you're doubting Jesus can heal. Or maybe you're here this morning and you just lost your job and it's all you can do to put food on the table and that's even getting difficult. And so you're doubting that Christ will provide. I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus' response to the Father is the exact same response he has with us. He doesn't turn away. He doesn't walk away, he doesn't say, whoa, this is too much. But he challenges us and tells us that he's not scared of our doubts. That leads me to the second thing that we can learn from the Father's words, and it's this. We should allow our doubts to drive us to the feet of Jesus. All right, I mentioned that Jesus is okay with our doubts, and he is, right, he's not scared of those. But I will tell you this, Jesus loves us far too much to leave us in our doubts. Because Jesus loves us, he wants our doubts to become moments of faith in him. Right? Jesus wants our doubts to make us come to a situation and say, Jesus, I don't understand this, I don't get it, why, I don't understand why this is happening, but I know that your power is made perfect in my weakness. Jesus, I, I don't get what's going on, I don't, I don't understand it, but I know that you love me and that you're working it for good for me. Hmm. When we take our doubts to the feet of Jesus, when we allow those to drive us to Jesus, he will work miracles in our lives. I say that standing up here, a miracle myself, all right, this isn't me just talking out of my head, this is experience. All right, if you don't believe me, don't take my word for it. Take your failing marriage, take that to Jesus and watch him speak life and love into it. All right, take that burden you have for that uh, dying loved one, take that burden, take it to Jesus and watch him carry it for you. All right, take your struggle with providing for your family, take that struggle to Jesus and watch him provide in ways that you never could on your own. 
Fact is this morning, when we take our doubts and allow them to push us, to drive us to the feet of Jesus, he will work miracles. You know, the rest of this passage um, is too good to, uh, to skip out on. And so I wanna jump back into Mark 9 one more time. I'm gonna read the last couple of verses here, starting in verse 25. It says, and when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse. So the most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. You see, after that pivotal moment when I surrendered to Christ, my life didn't change immediately. Right? I still dealt with the consequences, the darkness of my past, still dealing with some of those things. But I'll tell you, time after time and little by little, Jesus took my darkness and changed it into light. Right Over time, Jesus gave me the strength to forgive my mom's ex-husband for the years of abuse and torment that he put me through. Right? Holy Spirit in me spoke up and forgave him because of the love of Jesus and because of the strength that Jesus gave me, right? Um, over, over some more time, Jesus allowed me to love my family even more than I ever had, and he strengthened our bond and brought us close together, even though we'd been through so much together. And just when I thought Jesus was done working, he took my passion for music and crafted it into a calling Right, for worship ministry and for students to teach the people of God and worship alongside them. And even today, God is using my story to impact the lives of others in ways that I never could have thought of. I want you to know that it doesn't stop with me. Jesus wants to do those miracles in your life as well. There's no doubt, there's no situation, there's no scenario that can stop him from working. Right? There's nothing that you can bring to the table where Jesus says, that is too much. He's the son of God. The creator of all. Nothing is too big for him. So I want you to know this morning that if you're struggling with doubts, it's okay to have those doubts. But Jesus wants you to take those doubts and turn them into moments of faith where you lean into him. And when we allow our doubts to drive us to the feet of Jesus, he will take your mourning and turn it into dancing. He'll take your darkness and he'll turn it into light. And he'll take your doubts and he'll turn them into praise. I wanna pray with you all this morning. Father, thank you, thank you that you're, you're in the work of redeeming. Thank you that you have worked um, in so many of our lives, all of our lives here, that you, that you have brought us to this place to praise you. And Jesus, we come with a heart of gratitude to prayer now. We know that you work miracles day in and day out, whether we see them or not. You've told us that, that it's okay to doubt, that we, that we, we have doubts, but that, that we don't stop there, right? You don't leave us stagnant in those doubts. And so Jesus, I pray that we would take those doubts and that we would use them for moments of faith in you. Jesus, I'm just overwhelmed and so thankful for who you are, for your resurrection power, for your love, for your forgiveness, for your grace. Just your very character is what has us in the room today. So we thank you for that. If you're here today and you've never made a decision to surrender to Jesus, I ask that you pray this prayer out loud with me. And I ask that all of us pray out loud um, in support of those praying it. So if you would pray with me. Heavenly Father, Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sin. 
Come into my heart and cleanse me of my sin. Give me the courage to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.